I'm in my mid twenties. Okay. A very transitional point in my life. When you're a teenager and you're an older teenager and you're in your early twenties. <clears throat> A lot of that time is really spent figuring out who you are. I didn't really do a whole, uh, a whole lot of that. In fact, I didn't really do a whole lot of anything in my late teens, early 20s. Up until recently, I've been a very sort of uh, sit back and you know, just kind of ride the wave kind of guy. <clears throat> I had dreams and goals and aspirations. But I never really sat down and planned anything out, you know. I was doing therapy the past several months, just where you just sit down and talk to a therapist, you know, not like uh, a psychiatrist or anything like that, just a therapist, just sitting down, talking things out, <clears throat> and it helped immensely, by the way, shout out to, um, shout out to, uh, Aspire, Aspire Health in Valparaiso, Indiana, um, I've mentioned plenty of times that I'm from Northwest Indiana, so that's not, <clears throat> you know, too much new information, I think, but, uh, you know, paints you a picture of the general area of where I am, that my bi that I'm comfortable going to Valparaiso, Indiana for my bi-weekly therapist appointment, so that can give you kind of a general, general geographic area of where I'm at, but I've said I'm in Northwest Indiana plenty of times for the time being anyway. <clears throat> But, um, one of the things we were discussing was this sort of defeatist attitude that I tend to have. <clears throat> Looking at things in terms of, there's no point in doing anything now for the future because I haven't done anything in the past for right now. So the example I like to give, I started playing guitar. The example I used to like to give. I started playing guitar at age 10. Um, <clears throat> got my first guitar for Christmas when I was 10 years old. First guitar, first BB gun. Both got them for Christmas when I was 10 years old. <clears throat> this is a little over 15 years ago. Because it's currently February 2021. So Christmas, when I was 25, was this past December. So 15 years ago, I started playing guitar. And I'd tell my therapist, like, I have maybe some months worth <clears throat> of daily practice under my belt. Now, if you add up all the days I've actually practiced, it's more than that. But daily practice versus, like, weekly or biweekly or a couple times a week is very different. So I estimate that the amount of practice I have <clears throat> and where I'm at as a guitar player, as a guitarist, is roughly the equivalent of, you know, a newbie putting in several months of, of daily practice. <clears throat> it's winter, man. It always chokes me up. I know this isn't helping, but I always tell people, like, look, it would be pretty bad even without this because it's winter. That's just how I am. Digression aside, had I spent the last 15 years practicing my guitar on a daily basis, I, I can't even imagine where I could be right now. If I had put the work in and gone through actual, you know, a learning system with daily practice over the last 15 years, I had 15 years of opportunity to practice daily and become a world-class guitarist. 
and I just let it slip through my fingers because I was lazy. <clears throat> now, if I start daily practice right now, I'll have 15 years of daily practice under my belt when I'm like 40. And I always thought, like, what's the point? <clears throat> what's the point of being 40 and just then being where I should be right now? And, you know, when I tell people things like this, their first response is always, well, would you rather be 40 and, uh, <clears throat> I used to tell people, like, would you rather be 40, they would say, would you rather be 40 and be where you want to be with, with the guitar or with drawing or whatever interests you have, or would you rather be 40 and not be where you want to be and still be in the same spot wishing you had spent 15 years since you were 25 practicing daily? And my response was, back then was always, well, I'd rather just not turn 40 at all. I'd rather not turn, you know, my current age plus a day, you know. <clears throat> Same thing with smoking. People, so, you know, there was a woman I used to play D&D &D with. She'd tell me, like, you know, that's going to take years off your life. And I told her, well, is there any downside to it? You know? She's like, if you want to, you know, if you want to live to see 60, you might want to quit that. And I'm like, 60? I don't want to live to see tomorrow. Let alone 60. Now bear in mind, this was in the past. This was in the past. I'm probably going to live at least another 15, 20, 25, 30 years. You know. <clears throat> 40 years, maybe. 50 years, maybe. I'm 25. I could have a lot, you know, I could have a long way to go from now depending on what I do. The big thing is the weight, you know. Shedding all this, shedding the visceral fat is really the big thing. Getting, getting more exercise in. I, I started, uh, I went to the gym on Sunday. Today's Tuesday. I'm planning on going back tomorrow, doing a different split, doing some abs. Then kind of eating a little better, been eating less sweets, less sugar. We don't really keep pop in the house. We don't really soda for you non, wherever I'm from. If you want to call it the Midwest, the center of the U.S., whatever. We don't really have any of that in the house, so it's a little easier to, you know, not consume tons of sugar. So that helps. But the point of all this is that in my mid-twenties, I've started doing a lot of things that I really should have done seven-plus years ago. You know, when I was an older teenager, when I was a young adult, when I was around 18, 19, I thought to myself, man, I really want to start eating better, hitting the gym, and, you know, actually losing some weight obviously never did. But another thing that I, you know, depending on how you look at it, this might not be a bad thing. A lot of people will say, well, a lot of people don't really find themselves until they're in their mid late twenties or even, or even later. But that's other people, right? I wanted to be someone great. I wanted to be one of the legends. And yet I took those formative years with the most opportunity possible and at best, I was just coasting by doing nothing, and at worst, I was actively detrimenting my own future. One of the things that I regret not doing back uh, as an adolescent and young adult the most, more so than not practicing the, the guitar, more so than not doing enough coding and getting programming under my belt, more so than not drawing, more so than any of these things, is examining myself and figuring out who I am and who I want to be and what I have to do to get there. Because I've been doing a lot of internal cross-examining and a lot of thinking lately. About what my ideals are and what I support and what I don't and I sort of go through cycles a lot. Almost in a somewhat bipolarish way. I'm not self-diagnosing myself with any disorders here. Disclaimer, don't, you know, think that's where I'm going with this, but some days I just feel like I'm on top of the world. And then other days I feel like there's no point in doing anything. Again, things have been getting better lately. They really have. 
But I find myself in these sort of cycles in, in the same way when it comes to, like, ideals. Like, one day I'm, you know, all like, hot war now. Let's just get the hedge fund managers and the, and the, and the Wall Street elites and tear the whole system down, you know, and rebuild it to be better. And if there's pain along the way, so be it, you know? You can't build, you don't, you don't build muscle at the gym, okay? You don't build muscle at the gym. You tear down muscle at the gym. And then assuming you get an adequate amount of protein and nutrients and sleep, your body builds the muscle back up better from the torn down muscles that you tore up at the gym. Now, I'm not saying you want to, you know, tear your muscles to a huge extent where you've got, like, you know, you don't want to give yourself, like, muscular fissures or anything like that. I still think it should be pronounced fissure. But maybe that's just me. In any case. And so I think to myself, well, we've got to do something, okay? Okay. We've got to build an omelet here. But before we can do that, we've got to figure out which eggs we can crack. You know, which eggs we're okay with cracking and which ones we're not. So some days I'm like, hot war now, tear down Wall Street. I don't care if everybody's debit cards stop working and the economy goes into shambles because we we can we can build it back better. Okay? There's grain, there's fields of grain and livestock everywhere. Like we, we can figure this out guys. There's gotta be something we can do. The only reason things are the way are the only reason that things are the way they are right now is because somebody is actively keeping it that way for their own benefit at other people's expense. You know, I used to be a very sort of pro establishment uh, conservative, the kind of, you know, where, where people would talk about like, you know, when the whole Occupy Wall Street stuff start was happening, I was like, no, you don't understand. These bankers are, you know, the economy and, and the, the financial institutions and this and that. And over time, you know, my viewpoint changed. <laughs> Probably one of the biggest shakeups to that was the whole game stonks thing. You know, a lot of, uh, in other days, I'm like, okay, let's, let's use the system. Let's trust in the system. Okay. Let's go with the barn strategy of local. Um, I know he didn't create this idea, but I, but he's who I've heard it from. I follow a lot of different people, you know, um, I follow a lot of different people and, I don't get upset when people hear me talking about certain people's ideas and assuming that I'm some sort of blind follower of them. Like, if I talk about things that Steven Crowder says that I like and I agree with, people might automatically assume that I'm this huge, diehard Steven Crowder fan and I believe everything he says and I'm on board with him 100%. That's just not the case. Same thing with, you know, Robert Barnes of Viva Fry. I have plenty of disagreements with them. Uh, on a regular basis, and with Stephen Crowder, and with Tim Pool, and with uh, you know some, and, and I have a lot of agreements with some fairly left wing people, like you know my friend Paul. He's politically my opposite. He's like my political rival in a sense. Like he, like think of mathematics. If you multiply something by negative one, you get its opposite. You know, multiply three by negative one, you get negative three. In terms of politics. Paul is negative me, or I'm negative Paul. You know, I'm not saying this in a good or bad way. I'm talking about it in a negative in a mathematical sense. Sort of like positive punishment and negative punishment in psychology. That's not referring to what's good and what's bad. Positive punishment is where you add something like pain or, or some sort of a proactive punishment. Whereas negative punishment, you know, positive punishment would be like spankings or adding pain. 
or um, making someone do labor as punishment or something. You're adding strain. You're adding strain on their on their body. Negative punishment is where you take things away. You take away the kid's electronics to punish them for bad behavior. That's positive and negative punishment. It's referring to the addition or subtraction of things not good or bad. So when I say Paul is negative me politically, I'm not saying he's the bad version of me. I'm saying he's my my opposite mathematically when it comes to politics. And yet we're pretty good friends. Um, you know, at being busy adults lately, being bit busy poor adults, we don't hang out nearly as much as I would like to. I believe the sentiment's the same on his side. We gotta hit each other up again sometime, man. In any case, uh, new tangent upon tangent aside. I can find disagreements with people that I agree with generally. I can find agreements with people I disagree with generally. But overall, when it comes to this internal cross-examination, I'm still working on it. And I wish I wasn't. I wish I wasn't still working on it. I wish I had done it years ago. But you know how the saying goes, wish in one hand, crap in the other, see which one fills up faster. But, on the other hand, I see people like people I know that don't play any instruments. <laughs> they think I'm a pretty good guitarist. They think I'm really good at the guitar. You know, I did a live stream a while back on Twitch where I was just playing my guitar. I was covering, I was doing original songs and covering some Green Day. You know, I'm generally not one to brag. Um, not because I'm modest, but because I'm self-hating. I just don't think there's much to me to brag about. The one thing I will brag about is that I do a pretty mean rendition of uh, Holiday by Green Day. Like, I was doing that in the studio with the band the other week. This dude that was hanging out there, he was like, dude, that sounded like, you, that sounded like Billy Joel Armstrong. He's like, that sounded like Green Day. I was like, it's pretty good. But, you know, my sister can draw really well, especially for her age and for the amount of time she's been doing it. Um, cause she's been doing it for a while and she's a teenager. She can do it fairly well, but from her perspective, right? Oh, there's so many people who are so good at drawing. They can sketch and they can color and they can render and do all these amazing things that she just can't do. And I'm like, man, you're really good at drawing. Or when it comes to playing the guitar and singing, you know, she looks at me and she's like, you're really good at singing. You're really good at playing the guitar because she doesn't play the guitar. She doesn't un... Because she doesn't play the guitar, and because my Twitch viewers don't play guitar, they don't understand my shortcomings. They can't see it. So it's all about perspective, right? One of the big issues I think facing this country in terms of society and so many things, and so many countries, so many societies around the world in which we live, is that nobody is cross-examining themselves. Nobody is looking at what they believe and what they support from the other side. Nobody is saying, is this thing that I'm supporting really good? Nobody is making arguments against themselves. And look, I'm just as guilty in a lot of ways, especially a year ago, a couple of years ago, some months ago. I was really guilty of this. But lately I've started thinking to myself and I look at my policy positions and I say, what is the, uh, you know, I, I look at the faults in my own ideas and I look at the pros of other ideas. I look at the other side and I say, what is right about this? What, if anything, can I find that's right about this? When I see people calling for social safety nets and, 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 and government uh, redistribution of wealth, I say, what is the positive aspect of this that drives people to like these ideas? And on the surface, on the surface, it, um, it seems pretty good, right? 
I mean, <laughs> Marxism is a really good PR slogan, or has a really good PR slogan, if nothing else. If nothing else, Marxist socialism, Marxist communism, has a really good PR slogan. To each according to his need, from each according to his ability, or the other way around. Either way you phrase it. Sounds pretty good. Now, what are the failings of it? That's what I think a lot of people don't understand. Now, from looking at the failings or the, 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 the downsides, at the very least, of my own positions that I've held. Okay, what are some of the downsides of laissez-faire capitalism? What are some of the downsides of the every man for himself succeed solely on your own merits? Well, there are people who just can't. There are people who physically or mentally are not able to compete in the um, in the uh, the modern world of marketable skills that we live in. Um, maybe because they have a physical disability. Maybe because they were poisoned with lead or have fetal alcohol syndrome. I don't know. But there's people for whom we should be looking after. Now, I think that that should come in the form of charity. I think that if uh, the church, as you know, the as a as a concept, I think if the if the ideals of of, of Christian voluntary charity were strong enough, I think that wouldn't even be an issue, which we would need to examine. But they're not. So we've got to think to ourselves, okay, what what do we got to do? Well, at the very least, we need to have a way that people who can't compete um, on the level required to uh, provide for themselves fully can eat and have a roof over their heads, okay? I'm a pretty conservative guy. I'm a pretty open market capitalist guy. But I will also say that people who are incapable of competing either permanently or acutely. Even people who are just down on their luck and genuinely want to get back out in the world and, and, and want to be able to fend for themselves need that opportunity, that spark, can, can do so. So maybe, maybe, think of it like this. You know the phrase, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. Okay. You can teach a man to fish, but if he doesn't have a fishing pole or at least a line and a hook, he can't fish. Even if he knows how. If he doesn't have the tools necessary, he can't do it. So maybe... Maybe we can have some sort of... And maybe if... Um, voluntary charity isn't covering everybody's need for fishing poles. There can be some sort of program in place that people who know how to fish but need a pole can, you know, get a pole on loan from the government. So let's say you have, you know, let's say you have a guy who comes to his government office and he says, hey, I, I know how to fish. I need a pole to fish. So you could say, okay, here's your fishing pole. We're going to give you this fishing pole paid for by taxes but you have to as you catch fish for every five fish you catch whether to eat or to sell to buy grain or whatever for every five fish you catch you got to hold one back you have to sell it and you have to pay us back that money until the price of the fishing pole is paid off interest free no interest on it because this is a guaranteed government loan. So there's no interest, but there is a principal, and you've got to pay off this principal. Um, Tim Pool, whom I watch regularly but disagree with on a lot of things, um, as hard as it is to do because he doesn't really say a whole lot to disagree with, but they were, they were having a discussion on his podcast about uh, student debt, right? Now, on the one hand... You've got these boomer memes of the student debt crisis solved. One, you took out a loan. Two, pay it back. 
Um, no. <laughs> See, it's almost like these loans were designed to not be able to be paid back, which ties into my earlier series called Them, which I am planning on at some point uh, editing up and finishing. It's, it's coming soon, trademarked. Um, but one of the ideas proposed is to forgive all the interest and keep the principal and allow people to pay off the principal without charging interest on it. And that's something that I support because one, a, at the very least, at the very least for the guaranteed federal and state loans, any guaranteed loan should not have interest in the first place because the whole point of interest on a loan is to say, okay, I'm taking a risk by loaning this to you. So I'm going to charge interest in exchange for taking this risk and providing you with the capital. If we're talking about guaranteed government loans, there shouldn't be interest in the first place. There never should have been. So forgiving the interest while keeping the principal um, will, uh, will be a good solution, in my opinion, in the short term. Because it won't completely destroy any semblance of an economy that we still have, like the like just forgiving all... Uh, outstanding student debt for everybody would, you know, uh, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make everyone have to create a wheelbarrow full of hundred dollar bills down to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread. Like, uh, the, like the, like one of the proposed plans would, but it would negate the cycle, the vicious cycle of never being able to get rid of them or pay them back. Um, and then eventually you could phase out government loans entirely at federal and state level for anything that's not, you know, that, that doesn't have an actual job waiting for you at the end. So if you're going to college for, you know, philosophy or a language major or gender studies or whatever, sure, by all means, go ahead, but you're going to have to find a way to pay for it yourself. And in turn, that will actually cause the price of college at least for these sorts of degrees to go way down because the whole reason college is, is, is as is as expensive as it is is because colleges okay a very short uh, you know thir you know 30 second overview colleges say okay you want to go here for a degree you have to pay this amount of money people say oh well i can't afford it big daddy government comes in and says wait hold on a second we'll give you a loan for this um it's a guaranteed loan you know we will get our money back from you um, uh, if, you know, as long as you live, you will owe us this money and we will get it back from you or you will die with some of the, um, with some amount of balance remaining. One of the two. Okay. Uh, and then the colleges are like, oh, wait, if the government's going to guarantee loans to people to pay for our college tuition and books and everything, we can just charge whatever the hell we want for it. So the colleges are like, hey, you know, in your in your daddy's or granddaddy's day, it cost five hundred dollars all in to go get this associate's degree. Um, now it's going to cost you, pff, I don't know, thirty thousand dollars for to to go here for two years for your associates. Government comes, they're like, it was it was like, are they really going to pay that? Government's like, okay, here's a loan for thirty thousand dollars, and the college is like, oh shoot. <laughs> Lel XD, we can just charge thirty thousand dollars for what used to cost five hundred. Okay, <laughs> all right, GG no re, GG easy no re XD. Uh, let's just do it. So, examine yourself. Cross examine yourself. Take a look at your beliefs, the things you support, and say what are the flaws in this solution that I'm proposing for the world's problems? And is there a way to mitigate those flaws and make my proposed and so supported solution even better? Can I get this any closer to a perfect solution? Never assume that your ideas or the ideas of other people that you support are perfect. Always assume that they're imperfect. Always assume that they are flawed. And try to find those flaws, okay? Try to find the flaws with democratic socialism. Try to find the flaws with laissez-faire capitalism. And try to find 
the minimum amount of going the other direction that you have to do in order to make your plan work, okay? If you're a laissez-faire capitalist, find the minimum amount of left-wing socialism that you have to do in order to make society work. If you're a libertarian, find the least amount of government that has to exist for your society to exist and for you and your family to be to, to be able to be well off. If you're a democratic socialist, find the largest amount of fair market capitalism that has to exist for people to be able to live their lives the way they see fit. Always assume that your ideas are flawed. Look for the flaws. And try to think of what you can do to mitigate those flaws. Because none of us are going to come up with a perfect plan. But we can come up with plans and we can work on them and iterate on them and build upon them until we have the closest thing to perfection that we can achieve. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Christian perspective is that that's not just a license to do whatever you want and purposefully sin as much as you want. No. That's saying, sure, you have flaws. You've fallen short of God's glory. But you can still improve yourself and iterate upon yourself to be as close to being godly as you can. So when you have an idea, when you have a plan to fix all the world's problems, sit down as the cross-examiner. Sit down from the other side and say, what are the flaws in this plan? Identify them. Once you've identified the flaws, then you can begin the process of mitigating them. I'm a fairly conservative guy, socially and economically. More so economically, by far. I'm a fairly laissez-faire capitalist guy. But if you teach a man to fish, and he has no line, no hook, no pole, and not even the resources from which he can craft those things, should he be taught how to do that as well, you can't fish. You can teach a man to fish. You can teach a man how to craft a fishing pole with a line and a hook. And you can show him where those resources are to be able to make a line and a hook and fish. And then once he fishes enough and sells the, uh, the fish, then he can get a better line and a better hook and get an, a pole and make a reel and all this good stuff. But if, if you have no starting point, Somebody's got to come along and bail you out. Give you, at the very minimum, a line and a hook. I'd prefer to see a move toward the Christian ideals of voluntary charity and voluntary uh, upkeep of society. Voluntarily making sure everybody has at the very least, a line and a hook and the knowledge to fish. But, if that's not working, and our solution is to have the government provide fishing poles to the people who know how to fish, and education, free classes on how to fish, on an interest-free, guaranteed loan, so be it. That's coming from me, a conservative capitalist, Republican guy. Cross-examine yourself. Your ideals. Your beliefs. Your virtues. What you stand for. Who you are as a person. Cross-examine that. Sit down in the prosecutor's chair. Across from yourself. Across from your ideals. Across from your beliefs. Across from your ideas of virtue. 
Sit down in that prosecutor's chair and challenge everything you think you know. Find the flaws. Pick it apart. And then you can move back over to the, de to the defendant's chair. And you can move forward from there. It's the only way we're going to survive as a society. It's the only solution moving forward. At least in the opinion of some Joe Schmo layman from Northwest Indiana. Speaking of that guy, that's him, it's me, this is North Sea Hero, signing out.